Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, um, Ms. Collymore. Um, um, greetings to old friends and people with whom I've shared platforms around the world. Um, I have spoken and worked in many countries around the world. And as chairman of the United Nations on Governance and Oversight, it's also taken me to many places around the world. Um, I say this not out of self-praise, but to indicate to you that I speak from both an academic background as a very senior corporate lawyer and also a practical background because I've been the chairman and directors and non-executive director of companies in the UK, in Europe, and in South Africa. So I sit here in my library and uh, talking to you, but I'm covered in corporate scars because those of you in business and uh, Kimberly, if I may call you by your first name, from the Republic Bank, I've been chairman and uh, non-executive director of banks. And uh, I'm fully aware of the duties that the director has, especially in the financial sector. It's an onerous task. But it, I believe that people become non-executive directors. When they're successful, they do it, they give back to society, or society enabling them to be successful. Because nowhere in the world, I believe, does a non-executive director get fully compensated for taking on a task that puts his personal estate and reputation at risk. And uh, you make a contribution back to society for being successful. I've been successful as a corporate lawyer, as a business person, and um, for the last 27, 28 years, I focused on giving back to society through corporate governance. So um, thank you, um, Faye, if I might call you by your first name, um, for that very detailed introduction. I think you know much more about me than I know about you. <laughs> But uh, I'm delighted to meet you, even though it's virtual. And um, I do have some slides tonight. And in those slides, I'm going to take you back to pre-first uh, Industrial Revolution, then the Industrial Revolution. And what happened to the formation of a company limited with limited liability and the impact it's had during the 20th century and then into the 21st century and the way we are today. So could I have the slides which I have sent to you, please up, share the screen. Right, so see enterprise value creation, but um, you have correctly in the uh, heading to your webinar this evening, this afternoon, talked about value creation. But you will see as I progress through this talk this evening that enterprise, the word enterprise has been added to value creation. And an enterprise, if you look it up in the Oxford Dictionary, for example, or Wikipedia, or Google it, it means the business firm. So value creation to business, what is that? So. And we have the first slide, next slide, please. So I told you I'm going to take you back and take you on a journey. In the 17th and 18th century, there were entities, but they had unlimited liability. Wealthy families gave capital, which was really risk capital, because if a business failed, they were still liable to the creditors and to the employees. And so started a conversation which moved into the middle of the 19th century. Should we, 
the government of the day representing the people in the United Kingdom. And also the discussion was in Massachusetts, in the United States, should we create an artificial person and give that artificial person limited liability? Next slide, please. Well, there was at the time much opposition to this, especially from theologians. So Lord Thurlow was a well-known theologian at the time. And exactly in 1844, he said the following, who are we as mankind, and ladies present in those days it was mankind and not humankind, who are we as mankind to believe that we can create a person that has no mind, no heart, and no conscience? He was correct, Lord Thurlow, because when the government of the day representing society created this artificial person. They created also an incapacitated person. It has no mind, heart, mind, soul, or conscience. When something goes wrong, and it does always, there are valleys and peaks in the business world, that's why I said, I have corporate scars, and that's how we learn. Um, we go through these peaks and valleys, but um, when wealthy families today, or wealthy person, or a financial institution, such as Republic Bank, um, takes equity in an IPO, initial public offering, they subscribe for shares, for a share in the company. Now, through the corporate architecture, shareholders appoint the directors. And these wealthy families were the shareholders. And of course, they appointed members of their families as directors. And so, the primacy of the shareholder started developing in the last half of the 19th century. And this concept that the shareholders were the owners of the company became a common conversation. And it was believed that you were actually working for these shareholders as if the company didn't exist. But of course, there was a focus then on increasing the wealth of shareholders, and there was a focus on financial capital, as if intellectual capital, human capital, natural capital, all the other resources we use and the relationships with our stakeholders were in silos away from financial capital. Well, next slide, please. The primacy of the shareholders was reinforced into the 20th century, when in the state of Michigan, the Ford Motor Company Limited, that had a very successful product called the Model T Ford. And in 1919 made excessive profits, $65 million, which was a lot of money, probably $6.5 billion today. Henry Ford, who I believe was the pioneer of inclusive capital, because if you listen what happened, as chair, chair, he said, I'm going to take this excessive profit and use it to improve the plant and machinery to produce more effectively our model T Ford. And I'm going to increase the wages of employees to encourage them to work longer hours and even sometimes some weekends to meet the demand for our product. The Dodge brothers, who were then a minority shareholder and later became a competitor, said you cannot do that. We as the shareholders are the owners of the company and we are the primary stakeholder. You should use that to declare a special dividend to the shareholders before you start increasing wages of employees. The board of the Ford Motor Company Limited refused and said they would continue 
to increase the wages of employees. The Dodge brothers went to court and got an injunction, an interdict, as we call it, um, to stop this. And the court directed the majority of that profit to be paid as a special dividend to shareholders. Can you imagine a Supreme Court in any country, in Trinidad, and I've been to Trinidad, I've been to several of your islands. Um, any court today making an order like that, it would be an outrage to society. See how society has changed. But in those days, there was a focus on the shareholder and a focus on success being equated with three criteria, increased profit, increased share price, and increased dividends. If you achieved those three things, you were a successful company. Even if that bottom line was being subsidized by society and the environment. And next slide, please. We know the turn into the 20, 20th century, that by the end of the 20th century, we had reached ecological overshoot, which is the technical term for the fact that by 1995 to 97, it was empirically established that we, and in the main limited liability companies, because it's the chosen medium through which business is conducted, were using and are still using natural assets faster than nature's regenerating them. Clearly not a sustainable matter. And the myth, myth that shareholders were the owners of the company was absolutely debunked during the latter half of the 20th century. Shareholders have no rights to possess the company's assets, to use the company's assets, to manage the business of the company. That's the directors and senior management. They can't take any income of the company. The only way they can receive money from the company is if the board decides to declare a dividend and there's sufficient liquidity to pay that dividend. If there is winding up or liquidation of the company, of course, of corporate failure, business judgment call that goes wrong, shareholders, the concomitant of having no liability to creditors or to employees or any other stakeholder, is that the shareholder is at the back of the queue on the ranking. And only if there's a residue of the paying creditors in their ranking, preferred, secured, preferent, etc. Only if there's a residue do shareholders get a dividend. And you all know that on liquidation, shareholders very seldom get any res res residual payment at all. Of course, if the shareholder is a financial institution or a pension fund, it's more evident as a pension fund, I'm going to take it as Kimberley's pension fund. <laughs> if I'm a trustee of Kimberley's pension fund, I have a duty to Kimberley to make sure, to the best of my ability, that I'm investing in the equity of a company for her, They're where the board has focused on the long term health of the company instead of the wealth of shareholders or any other stakeholders. So, but that is different. As Kimberley shareholder, when I decide to invest in the equity of a company listed, let's say, on the New York Stock Exchange, that pension fund owes no duty to that company, no responsibility to that company. And when something goes wrong, the company is always innocent because it's totally incapacitated, the same as a five-year-old child, if you were the guardian of a five-year-old child, something goes wrong, you would have the responsibility and the corporate leaders have that responsibility. And the wrath of society must not turn against the company, it must turn against its directors and senior management. Next slide, please. So the era of corporate leaders, something discussed with the late Professor Stark and Professor Penn of Harvard and she wrote, that brilliant article in the Harvard Business Review that um, 
Milton Friedman was not correct when he said that directors should follow the dictate of the shareholders, who the owners of the company. That was in 1970. And so the primacy of the shareholder was still in the minds of thought leaders. And for that, he got a laureate prize. Well, he was wrong with respect to the deceased because many of the companies he was speaking about were making the profit and increasing their profit, which he said was the duty, but being subsidized by society and the environment. And the time had come to challenge the maximizing of shareholder value at any cost. And it actually distracted boards from building the company's long-term health. Because the following statement I'm going to make, please remember it. If the collective mind of a board gets it right to make a business judgment call, which is positive for the long-term health of the company, it's for the long-term benefit of all its stakeholders, without giving primacy to any particular stakeholder. Next slide, please. And the Ocean Terma, and financial analytic firm in the US started analyzing companies listed on the S&P 500. And you will all know that iconic companies are listed on that stock exchange. And this is a most fascinating slide because you'll see what is gold, and I hope it's come through as gold, you can see it, are the intangible assets which do not appear on a balance sheet according to financial reporting standards, be they US GAAP or IFRS standards. So let's go back to 1975 and Mr. Milton, Professor Milton Friedman said that the sole purpose of the company is to make profit. Let's have a look. 17% only was so-called intangible assets such as the reputation of the company. But by the 1980s, there was a realization in the world that there'd been environmental degradation. And you will all remember, some of you will remember, old enough to remember, that in 1983 through the United Nations, the World Commission was held chaired by Brundtland, former prime minister of Sweden. Bob will remember it well. And um, the Brundtland Commission, as it became known, worked from 1983 to 1987 and said that for sustainable development in a resource-constrained world, environmentally degraded, there are three critical factors, the economy, society, and the environment. And they have to be thought of on an integrated basis, 1987. So there was suddenly a realization from providers of capital be they pension funds, banks, or insurance companies. So well, really, the money in the public bank is not the public's money. It's the money of the depositors. And banks don't have money. They have debits and credits. <laughs> um, so the providers of capital started thinking, well, well, hang on a second, there is more importance. And by the late 90s, you will see that only 32% of the market cap of companies listed on that stock exchange, the number of shares in issue times the market price, was represented as additives in a balance sheet according to US generally accepted accounting principles for most of the companies listed on the S&P 500. By the move into the 21st century, it moved to 20%. And the last analysis was done in December 2020, right at the end of the first year of our pandemic. It had moved to only 10%. The rest are the so-called intangible assets. But you will see that the ESG space, as it became known, was becoming more and more important as the world became filled with realization that could we have infinite growth in a finite world? 
not an easy question to answer. And the answer seems to be in the negative. And that's a frightening thought. We talk about climate change, which is very important to save the planet. I want to give you an assurance tonight, and I, I haven't got a, I can't rub a genie out or anything, but I'll tell you what, in a million years, planet Earth will still be here in the galaxy. The critical question is whether Homo sapiens will be on that planet. That's the question. And that's a question for directors of these incapacitated persons that are so critical to the creation of capital, the creation of jobs in our developed world and our developed world. Next slide, please. So we move from Professor Friedman's free economy. I always say when I talk and I lecture to students, there's anything free about him. The only thing free about his free economy was the subsidization from society and the environment. 21st century, we started looking at things differently. We started looking at value. What was really the value? And you've heard this saying that uh, society is the licensor of the company. Well, that's an understatement. Society was the creator of the company because the governments that passed the legislation were the representatives of society. They created for society. So historically, we looked at book value, the difference between total assets and total liabilities. Was the book value greater or less than the market value of companies listed on the CAC, Frankfurt, Johannesburg, New York, London, Stock Exchange, wherever it was? Was the present value of discounted future cash flow as positive? You see, everything was being looked at through a financial lens. Next slide, please. But value today, the critical question is not how much money is the company. The critical question is how has the company made its money? Has it made it at your expense? What are the positive and negative impacts on the triple aspects of a company's business model and outputs, financial, social, and environmental? Does the company have a business model which actually enhances these positive impacts from its activities and its product or service that it renders? Has it in its business model got a strategy also developed which eradicates or ameliorates the negative impacts on these three critical dimensions for sustainable development enunciated in 1987? Have sustainability issues been embedded into the business model? Has the company, through the, its mind, the board, identified the critical sustainable development goals published in 2015, pertinent to the business of the company, into its business model? Conversely, what were the impacts, have been the impacts of the economy, environment, society on the company itself? So you have impacts on financial condition, operating performance, and risk profile. You have financial reports, the annual financial statement, which are resilient, filled with rigor and consistency. In the ESG space, which became more and more important, as you saw from that slide, many framework providers and standard setters entered that space. There was clutter and confusion for preparers. And for users, comparability became diluted. As chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council, I, with my colleagues, arranged the corporate reporting dialogue where we try to get these framework providers and standard setters in a room together to try and harmonize these standards, to remove this clutter and confusion so that I, representing Kimberley, sorry, Kimberley's pension fund, could, with greater information, compare company X to company Y, and on a more informed basis, make the decision, no, it's at Kimberley's best long-term interest that I invest in company X. So integrated thinking, to think of these things as actually the resources used by a company and its relationships with its stakeholders and the stakeholders' relationships with the company 
have always been integrated. As stated by Brundtland in 1987, just sort of went over everybody's heads. But we have to connect, integrate the significant financial matters and the significant sustainability matters that come out of sustainability reports, or as they will be known, as you will see in a moment, the International Sustainability Standards Board standards. So the critical question, has there been value added to the enterprise that's through one lens? And what have been the impacts to society and the environment? So next slide, please. So in developing the IR framework, which was published in December 2013, the IRC was formed in 2010. It took us three years talking to iconic companies and academics and uh, very experienced chartered accountants and corporate lawyers around the world. We said there were six major resources or capitals that are used by companies around the world. Financial, manufacture, plant and machinery, human capital, people, intellectual capital, IP natural capital, the natural assets, and social capital, the relationship between the company and stakeholders. Next slide. And there was a value creation process. You had these inputs into the company, which is the blue circle there. You've got the activities in the company making its product. That's an output. But you have an output as well, such as waste, the other outputs. And the product you'll see is still in the company, but that product goes out and starts impacting on those resources and impacting to summarize those resources on the economy, on society and the environment. And it has outcomes. So if you take that great company, the Coca-Cola company, 120 years old, and suddenly in the US there were allegations that the reason for the obesity of children in the US was Coca-Cola. And some countries slapped a tax on Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola rethought that for 128 years, I think it was at that stage, that they had focused on the brand. It was the most valuable brand in the world until Apple took, took that spot. But Coca-Cola announced, we will not advertise to children under the age of 12. We will arrange activities for children under 12 at all our bottling plants. We will make sure that we will make a Coca-Cola that has no sugar, no calories in it. And Coca-Cola light was developed. And so the mindsets were starting to change even in companies that were more than 100 years old. Next slide, please. So integrated thinking became the dictate of the day. Every com company is dependent on relationships with its stakeholders and the sources of value creation. You have, and I use the musical term symphony. It's a symphony of these resources and relationships. The board has to learn and understand the legitimate needs, interests and expectations and I add concerns because of the pandemic of its stakeholders. And only when you understand this, can you actually have an informed oversight over management's proposals about strategy, for example. And you need this to make a business judgment call in the long-term best interest of the health of the company. There are greater stakeholder expectations than ever before because of social media. There should be agenda items at each board meeting of any business, any company, whatever the business is, agriculture, financial, technical, whatever the business is, inputs to outcomes. Does the board actually understand what the outcomes are of its product or its service when it goes out to society? What are the relationships with your stakeholders? There are many concerns that stakeholders have had through the pandemic. IT governance and cybersecurity, absolutely critical because cybersecurity is one of the risks to business alongside climate change. We've learned that through supply chains, a major company listed on the London Stock Exchange 
if it has a major service provider, for example, that is using child labor, if that becomes known, the company would lose 40% of its market cap the next day on the stock exchange. And you should have an agenda item risks and opportunities of climate change. Tomorrow I'm speaking at a climate change conference. And it's absolutely critical that the board's mind is directed with an agenda item. What are the risks and opportunities that this company, the business of this company, can suffer or seize an opportunity because of climate change? And that's a reality. This next slide, please. So the more informed reports are, the more transparent your accountability as a board. So directors owe their duties to the company, this incapacitated artificial person that has no heart, mind, soul, or conscience. You as a director are the conscience of the company. The tragedy of this concept of the primacy of the shareholder and the three criteria of profit, increased share price, and increased dividends was that we had a century of unsustainable development because we ended the century going into the 21st century with natural assets being used faster than they were being regenerated. Clearly not sustainable. Next slide, please. So sustainability reporting became very important. And in the turn into the 21st century, 80% of issues were sustainability issues and only 20% were financial issues. And so IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants, arranged a meeting at the United Nations where I was present. And international institutions such as the World Bank, um, uh, other great institutions around the world, were invited to that meeting, Chatham House rules, nothing goes outside the room. But we discussed that we are doing annual reports in trying to discharge our duty of accountability to the company and through the company to all its stakeholders by just doing the financial statements according to certain standards. And yet the makeup of the market cap was at that stage 80% wasn't appearing as an additive in a balance sheet. So clearly we were not discharging our duty of accountability, but that space was becoming more and more important. I said at that meeting, yes, it's becoming more and more important, but without the numbers, it's not meaningful. And what people are now doing, they're reporting in two silos. We've got to connect, we've got to integrate the two. And the discussion progressed. Do we connect or do we integrate? The word integrate won <laughs> the discussion. But other framework providers, as I've said, already entered the space and there was clutter and confusion. Next slide, please. So there was a cry suddenly for an international sustainability standards board, the same as we have an international accounting standards board under the IFRS. The EC advisory group, meanwhile, was redesigning and are now going into the 2020 during the pandemic. The CRD had for four years plodded along and wasn't very successful in getting these framework providers and standard setters to agree to harmonization of standards, to try and make comparability more meaningful. And they were all dealing with the same public interest issues. In March 2019, at a conference in London, um, as then chair, now chair emeritus of the IRC, I was the speaker and I had fortunately in front of me, most executives of what I call the alphabet soup, GRI, they are all the acronyms, which you all know. And so I took the opportunity to say it's a social outrage that you have formed your association, your nonprofit organization, on, on these issues which are of importance to the world and to people around the world, but you see yourselves as competitors when you're all dealing with the same issues. Well, I also pointed out to them that the most important sustainable development goal was 17, which was collaboration, and you should be collaborating. Well, it took the scientists during the pandemic to show what 
perhaps SDG 17 actually meant the collaboration to within nine months develop a vaccine, which usually took five to nine years to develop. IOSCO, the entity that actually controls stock exchanges around the world in effect, has agreed that there should be collaboration. The World Economic Forum worked with the big four accounting firms to develop metrics on this. The Financial Reporting Council in the UK said, yes, there should be separate reports, but companies must report on sustainability issues. The International Federation of Accountants said there should be an International Sustainability Board sitting alongside the International Accounting Standards Board under the oversight of the IFRS. The IFRS then issued a consultation paper to close at the end of December 2020. Should we increase our mandate, not only financial reporting, but also sustainability reporting? And the overwhelming response was yes. Next slide, please. So, the, at the moment, this collaboration led to talks of merger, and as you probably all know, Sustainability Accounts Standards Board of America, San Francisco, has merged with the IRC. So you have a framework provider, which provides the structure of reporting, and the standard setter, which is the content of your report, merging under the Value Reporting Foundation. And TAS team, as I'm talking to you, is working with the TAS team of the IFRS to start creating and first will create, and we, the Value Reporting Foundation, of which I'm Chair Emeritus, have issued, but two months ago, we issued a prototype of this related financial reporting disclosure and value creation in regard to climate change standards. Next slide, please. So the wheel will not be reinvented in the ISSB, but uh, we'll learn from all these people who thought they were competitors and our collaborators. Sustainability, like a coin, has two sides. The Global Reporting Initiative saw it through the Brundtland eyes. What were the activities and the products impacts on those three critical dimensions, the economy, society, and the environment. Meanwhile, we started learning, particularly in the second half of the decade, second decade of the 21st century. We learned from the GFC and the collapse of Lehman Brothers, for example, that the economy could have a huge impact on limited liability companies, that society could have a huge impact on limited liability companies. I'll look for an example, coronavirus. That environment could have a huge impact on limited liability companies, climate change, different purposes, different audiences. But you will see, we were looking now at sustainability issues through a value creation lens, hence the addition of the word enterprise value creation. And could we create a national body, an international body with consistency, reliability, rigor, and improve comparability as we have with financial reporting. Next slide, please. So enterprise value creation, the impacts of the economy, the environment, society on the company, its financial condition, its balance sheet, its operating performance, its income statement and cash flow, its risk profile, its cost of capital. If you look at the statement of collaboration of the five uh, um, value creating entity standard setters and framework providers that have collaborated, CPD, CDSB, IRC, SASB, and uh, the GRI. Well, the EC was talking about non-financial reporting directives. About six weeks ago, they came out with corporate sustainability reporting directives. And only a few days ago said, we will try and align these with the standards that are going to come out to the International Sustainability Standards Board, which will be announced in November of this year at Glasgow at the Climate Change Summit. And the endeavor of the ISSB and the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directors 
is to work with the IAASB, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, to get assurance-friendly language so we can have reliable assurance, reasonable assurance of sustainability reports and integrated reports. So we look at enterprise value creation, preservation, because sometimes we have a business model that's actually eroding value. Well, we need to account for all that. Next slide, please. So value today in, has to be looked at through both these lenses. And we believe, I believe, and I'm speculating what's going to come out of the merger and it's going to come out of the ISSB, where we have teams working as I'm speaking to you, will be a focus on enterprise value lens. In other words, looking at how the economy, society, and the environment impacts on the limited liability company. But the limited liability company could still, of course, look at how its activities or its product is impacting on those three critical dimensions for sustainable development. In summary, as Tim Moen, the former chief executive of the GRI said, um, the first lens is looking how the company's activities and product impacts on the world. The enterprise value creation lens looks at how the world is impacting on the company. But they both are important. Next slide, please. So enterprise value creation, I say versus sustainability reporting, but they are related. Sustainability related financial disclosure standards would enable disclosure of how sustainability matters create or erode enterprise value. This type of reporting is different from sustainability reporting, which looks at the activities or the product's impact on those three critical dimensions. Next slide, please. So what we striving for, we all operating in this thought leadership around the world. And the SEC of America has now only uh, a couple of weeks ago said, no, we must start looking at sustainability reporting. And I'm using my words, but I'm paraphrasing what their statement was. Not reinvent the wheel. We must learn the lessons that these other framework providers and standard setters have learned over the last few decades in the world. So. These drivers of connection between sustainability performance and financial risk and return, climate change, and the global pandemic has actually driven this collaboration. And these two drivers have created a sense of urgency to establish this International Sustainability Standards Board as a stepping stone to a globally accepted comprehensive corporate reporting system, which would make the life of directors much easier, not less onerous, but much easier, because you have one standard. For preparers and users, it makes a lot of sense. Next slide, please. So enterprise value is value created for others as well. So in the IR framework, we say, providers of financial company are also interested in the value an organization creates for others when it affects the ability of the organization to create value for itself. No? You take account of the needs, interests, expectations, concerns of stakeholders, but always make a decision of the best interests of the company. That will mean that from time to time, one stakeholder will be benefited more than another. And that's why they trade offs between stakeholders. So companies in the EU by 2035, they don't want fossil fuel driven motor cars, fossil fuel plant machinery. It takes money to change to renewables. Some companies have said for the next three years, we're not declaring a dividend to shareholders because we want to use that cash and maintain our debt equity ratio, use that cash to change to, to renewables. One would think the share price would drop, but the share price of some of these companies has gone up because asset managers like BlackRock said, here's a board that's applied its mind to the long-term health of this company. And I owe a duty to my beneficiaries, all the 
7.3 billion dollars that they have available for investment. Uh, I have a duty to them to make sure I'm investing in the equity of a company that's got longevity. Next slide, please. So we are in a changed world. We've moved from profit at any cost to value creation, preservation, or noticing the erosion. So these standards are pertinent and they have to be connected. Integrated thinking, integrated reporting is becoming more essential than ever. And all these bodies I've been talking about, IFAC, the World Bank, um, Value Reporting Foundation, the IFRS have all recognized that these things have to be connected and integrated thinking and reporting is absolutely critical. So a board must spend more time understanding these reports, understanding the financials, take out the significant material matters and state it not in IFRS speak, which is incomprehensible to the vast majority of users, not in ISSB speak, which will be from November, you'll have ISSB speak, because words like ecological overshoot just run off the tongue, you know, of those dealing with sustainability issues. But in clear, concise, and understandable language, so people can understand it and make an informed assessment about a company. Reporting is the lifeblood of accountability. And if we can get it right, then people are more informed, particularly the providers of capital, which are people walking in the streets in Trinidad, New York, London, Johannesburg. Next slide, please. So that's my famous octopus, which I've showed around the world. In the tentacles of the octopus are things you have to do. You mandated, for example, to do an AFS according to IFRS standards in your part of the world. You may, in some countries, there's mandated to follow the TCFD, Financial Disclosure on Climate Change. Whatever you have to do, so sustainability reports, most companies today do sustainability reports. So that's all online. And you must be careful of all the information coming into a company through the net because knowledge gets lost in this mass of information. Directors have to make sure they really understand this. In the head of the octopus is your annual integrated report where you tell the story of your company and how your business model has got embedded in it at the SDGs pertinent to the business of the company. And why, as a matter of probability, you have got a business model which is going to result in the long-term health of the company. So I end by repeating what is attributed to be a statement by Winston Churchill. Some people say it's attributed to others, but I like the attribution to Winston Churchill in the last three weeks, three weeks before the end of the Second World War, or he wrote a four-page letter to his wife. And in the last sentence, he said, if I'd had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. And that's what we as directors have to do, spend more time understanding these things, really understanding and able to explain it in clear, concise, and understandable language. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.